Sunshine, do you want to say a quick hello before we uh, get into before uh, show you and I get into the dog and pony show? You're you're muted. You're muted, Dong Sung. You're muted. We cannot hear you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being interested in our new uh, PhD program in data science. Uh, I'm Dr. Dong Sung Zhang. I'm the interim executive director of the School of Data Science. Uh, so this morning, uh, we will give the first uh, information session about our program. Uh, uh, you will find a lot of details on the um, on the program website. Um, but this is a session where you know you can ask us any questions you may have right now. Okay, I will leave it to uh, Xiao Yu and Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. All right, so let me go ahead and I'll, I'll kick us off again. Good morning, um, happy Monday, and we know it's Veterans Day. We we appreciate you joining us. We are very excited to introduce the new PhD program for, for data science. For some of you who have been involved with UNC Charlotte, you know this has been a labor of love for several years. This has been a goal um, to launch this program. And so we're very excited. We are currently recruiting for fall 2025. Um, and so we're gonna try to give you some of the, the, the big picture information, answer your questions. But this is just the beginning of the conversation as you get a better sense of what UNC Charlotte has in store in terms of our plans for PhD. Um, and whether or not there's a fit for you in this program. So thank you one and all again for joining us. Um, go ahead and just roll on. So I'm gonna start with kind of the overview of the university. For some of you, this is old hat, um, but for some of you, it's gonna be brand new. The University of North Carolina, Charlotte, we're a fairly young institution. We were founded in 1946, um, but we have been on a rocket's trajectory in terms of our growth and expansion. Um, and we've got a few bona fides that we like to share. First off, we have been rising fast in the national rankings, U.S. News and World Report. We're most recently, we're in number 81 for public universities, um, 152 among public and private national. It's a broader measure as far as that goes. And, and that's important in part because it brings not just attention, but it brings resources to the university. Um, and that's one of the things for, for UNC Charlotte as, as North Carolina's urban research institution. Um, we have a commitment, we'll talk about the R1 in a second. Um, currently 75 bachelor's degree programs, the undergraduate 65 master's degree programs. And this will be, I believe 25 in terms of the PhD programs that the university is, is offering. We offered our first PhD program in 1993. And again, it's part of the growth and part of the commitment to the Charlotte region. 40% um, undergraduate student growth over the last decade. Um, but there again is a focus on what's going on at the research level. UNC Charlotte has made a commitment to be in the first tier of research universities, what's called R1. We anticipate getting that official notification um, in the next year that we will be an R1. And again, what that means is at the end of the day, resources, commitment of research dollars to students, PhD students and the PhD research that we do with Shrives Institution. Um, so again, we're excited for that recognition of that hard work. Um, in terms of the School of Data Science, on paper, we're also pretty young, founded in 2020, but it grows out of, a, of an earlier initiative called the Data Science Initiative. Um, we have been, we've been with these academic programs since 2011. Um, first a program in health informatics, then a program in data science in the master's level. Um, more recently in 2020, we launched the bachelor's in data science and then the sports analytics certificate, which we are planning to convert into a, into a bachelor's degree as well. Um, but that's subject to funding. Um, you can see the overall growth of the of the enrollment in our programs. Uh, there are currently over 800, um, almost 850 students um, who are active in our academic programs at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, the PhD has been approved by the state. There is one more formality that we have to go through, which is SACS approval. That's our accrediting body. That should come in the next month, um, but we are moving forward with the degree. So um, we are recruiting for the fall cohort. It's for the PhD, this is going to be, for those of you who've been through a master's program, 
this is a scale issue. It looks a little, little odd. When we're talking about master's programs, we're usually looking for 30 to 40 students in the first cohort. In a PhD program, it's a much more focused, um, much more intimate experience. It's a relationship with you and your, your faculty researcher. So we're looking to recruit four to five full-time students. Those would be funded. Um, and then four to five part-time students uh, in the first cohort for fall 2025. In terms of the mission of the program, this is where I'm going to start. I'm going to turn it over to Xiao Yu, um, Dr. Lee, to talk about kind of the, the big picture of what we're doing with the PhD program and then get down to some of the specific research areas. Dr. Lee, do you want to take it? Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Josh. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us in this information session on Monday morning. So my name is Xiao Yu Li. Uh, I'm the program director. So in uh, this session, I would like to take the time and give you guys an overview of our program, as well as our admission requirements and how to apply for the program if you're really interested in it. So uh, first of all, the goals of this program. <clears throat> so not only we want to uh, develop uh, our students with uh, data science, like skill sets and do uh, innovative research, we also want to have the environment where our students can do interdisciplinary research. So to address uh, issues or questions raised in complex and real world challenges. Uh, to prepare our students to be scientists and scholars, to, be, to become ethical and socially transformers, transformative leaders. And ultim ultimately we can foster a community engaged in teaching, learning and sharing knowledge, both locally and globally. So along these goals, towards these goals, we, uh, carefully designed our program. Uh, Josh, could you, do I have the control? Okay, thank you. And come up with uh, this PhD uh, program curriculum for our students that consists of uh, 74 credit hours. So these 74 credit hours includes a 18 credit hours for our core courses. We are going to talk about more about that. And then 36 credit hours for elective courses. Uh, 18 credit hours of dissertation research, and then two uh, credit hours of graduate courses about uh, respons responsible research conduct, conduct. So for those students uh, who have strong background in uh, data science, we'll talk about the details of how we define strong background in a later slide. So we do offer a advanced standing option for those students for whom they can take uh, fewer electives. So the core courses will remain the same as well as the dissertation, but those students in the advanced standing can take fewer uh, electives and focus more and st start uh, early on, on research and focus more on the research. And so they'll be on a faster uh, pathway to graduate basically. Uh, the program is also flexible or uh, we do open enrollment to uh, part-time students as well. And uh, in the next slide, I would like to talk uh, in detail about this curriculum. So we do have a set of core courses that we specifically designed for our students that includes statistics, fundamentals uh, for machine learning and AI, as well as ethics of, uh, in data science. So students will learn all these uh, fundamental skill sets and prepare them to uh, move forward to the following years for their qualifying exam as well as other elective courses. So standard sending uh, students, they need to take 36 credit hours of electives. So these courses can be either more advanced like uh, uh, algorithms or computing uh, courses or a specific domain uh, courses guided by the academic advisor. So we do have a comp comprehensive list of elective courses from various uh, areas, including business, intelligent information system, social science, and human well-being. So we do have a, a long list of uh, electives that our uh, students can select from. So when they're ready, the students will start doing their dissertation research. So the dissertation research requires 18 credit hours uh, for students. So that's a, a big picture for our PhD curriculum. This is a question about the advanced standing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me take. 
So we got okay. What okay? So we got a question asking about what is advanced standing. So uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, when we get to the admission part. But in general idea is for those students ha who have a strong background, like who, for example, who had a data science uh, degree, master degree in data science, and taken um, additional courses that we required already. But I I will get to the details in the following uh, slide. And um, yeah, so on this slide uh, shows a typical or suggested uh, year by year, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this slide shows a typical year by year milestone of, of our PhD students. So including both standard curriculum students and advanced uh, standing students, all of them are expected to finish the core curriculum in the first uh, academic year. And then they can uh, take their qualifying exam in the second year. So for advanced uh, standing students, uh, they can start taking the electives at the same time, uh, start, start moving forward for their dissertation research. For uh, the standard curriculum st uh, standing students, um, on the other hand, they probably need to continue taking courses by following the guidance of their academic advisor in year two and three. And then in year three, they will start um, the working on the dissertation proposal defense. And year four, they probably will uh, defense the proposal and continue working on uh, the dissertation and graduate in year five. So typically we expect a PhD student will graduate the program in five years and for advanced standing students may take a one, one last year, like four years. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Can, can I, I don't think I can, yeah, thank you. So uh, you probably can see uh, after the first year, you're going to work closely with uh, your academic advisor. So for students who pass the qualifying exam, they will identify their uh, faculty mentor or academic advisor. In a school, we now have over 80 core joint and affiliated faculty members who will be eligible to supervise our PhD students. And these faculty members are from 30 departments in various uh, research areas, including uh, business, computing and informatics, engineering, health and human si uh, services, humanity, earth and social sciences, so you, and science. So you can see we do have faculty members that's really from uh, various uh, disciplines. So it will be uh, very possible for our students to identify several faculty members that share the same research interest and then you can work with them closely for the, for the degree. Uh, the, we have uh, various research areas, but uh, we kind of summarize six key uh, research areas for the School of Data Science uh, faculty members. And potentially, we hope that this will give you guys a better idea about uh, which faculty member you actually want to work with in the future. And that will be uh, helpful if you have that in mind at the very beginning when you apply. Indicate in your application that in which research area you want to do the PhD degree and with which uh, faculty member you're potentially interested in um, finishing up the degree. So the six key research area includes uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that focus more uh, in the computing perspective for data science and uh, nanoscale science and materials. So uh, if you, if you, uh, I will show that link later, but if you go to our program website, you will see a, a page with all these detailed uh, research areas indicated as well as the faculties who are working in the, uh, in the area. So also online uh, misformation detection. And then uh, in the next slide, we have the other three smart and sustainable cities, uh, leadership reimagined and urban health. So I do have the link uh, added at the end where we'll lead you to the um, program website. You can see more details about uh, research areas and all the faculties that are 
uh, in each area. So if you want more information, feel free to browse our uh, website. And then if you have specific questions in mind, uh, we are always here and happy to answer any uh, questions regarding which research area may be of your interest. Yeah. Josh, you want to uh, step in and talk a Money little bit? Money conversation comes back to me. Uh, <laughs> so there were a couple, just before I talk uh, specifically about the tuition and, and how the... Um, support funding models work. Um, there was a question about advanced standing. This is always a point of confusion. When we talk about advanced standing, it's not transfer credits um, per se. What it is, is if the faculty determines that your degree, you have a master's degree that is relevant to the, to the PhD, they will give, they will grant advanced standing to you where, uh, where you start at that, that lower credit amount. You still have a course of studies you need to go through. But it's not, it's not specifically transferring classes, specific classes or credits. It's really the content area of the degree um, that has to be evaluated in the advanced standard. So just, and, and we can talk more about that when we get to the, to the chat. Um, the, um, and thank you, Dong Song. I see you're jumping in to answer some of the questions. I appreciate that. Um, I have thrown the link into the PhD website in the, in the chat as well. Um, so, when we look at the tuition model for um, for the PhD, one of the things that specifically for the alumni that you're going to notice that's not there is the SBTI. Um, that's the school-based tuition increment. That the tuition that is charged for the PhD is the standard graduate tuition for the for the university. That said, North Carolina is is a great place to study if you are a, if you are a resident of North Carolina because you get in-state tuition. And so this is where it starts to get a little confusing. So when you look at the when you look at the cost of the program, there was an earlier question on how much does the PhD cost. Um, with our system, it the answer is always it depends because it depends on how many credit hours, how long you are in the program, how long it takes you to meet the, the program requirements. Um, for each semester that you are enrolled, for each course as a North Carolina resident, you pay fifteen hundred eighty-seven dollars ninety-eight cents. That is the two thousand twenty-four twenty-five tuition. Um, that will likely go up slightly three to four percent when the new tuition uh, structure is approved by the legislature. That usually happens in July every year. Um, so there'll be a slight variation. Um, if you are taking six credit hours as North Carolina resident, you can see what the costs are, nine credit hours. Um, if you are not a North Carolina resident, you are an international applicant or you're coming from South Carolina or from outside of, outside of the state, then you pay the non-resident. Um, what you're seeing the difference in those numbers is with the amount that the state of North Carolina subsidizes higher education for residents of North Carolina. And so if you wanna know what the real cost of the program is, look at the non-resident tuition, and that gives you a better sense of, of what the costs of operations are for the university. So um, if you are a full-time student, you can take up to 12 credit hours in a semester. Um, there is, there is a, kind of an incentive to do so. Um, you'll notice the way that the matrix works, nine plus credit hours. That means if you take nine or 12 credit hours, the cost is the same. So that's the incentive to take four, um, depending on your semester studies, that can vary. And depending on how many semesters you're in the institution at that registration number, that gives you kind of a, a ballpark cost of attendance. This does not include housing. Um, it does not include transportation. Um, it does not include healthcare per se. That said, we move to the funding package. Um, for a student who is admitted into the full-time program, there is the assumption that a funding package will be available for that student. So, this is kind of where things get complex because there's a lot of matchmaking. It's not just simply meeting the requirements of the program. It's also aligning with a specific faculty member and their research agenda. Um, that goes, but if there's an offer of admission for a full-time student, a well-qualified PhD student, typically what they're going to see is a funding stipend package of $2,300, $600 for the year. Now that covers tuition. Um, tuition is also part of that. Healthcare is also part of that. Um, there's a healthcare package that goes there as well. Um, so on top of that 2360, 
those things are covered as part of the funding package. Um, for part-time students, our program is open to part-time students. We will have courses that will be available for, for part-time students, but those students traditionally do not receive funding, at least not from the institution. They may be eligible for unsubsidized student loans and other forms of financial aid, depending on their status. Um, but usually that is a self-pay for part-time students. Oftentimes employers may provide, uh, if, you're, if you're working full-time, they may provide educational benefits that may defray some of the costs. But that's one of the challenges for, for part-time students in the, in the program. Dr. Zhang or Zhang or, or Dr. Lee, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, so um, for the doctoral students, if, um, if the school provides you a teaching um, assistant, assistant uh, scholarship, you are expected to be a TA or um, the instructor on the record. Um, so basically you will provide help with uh, teaching in the school. Uh, in, in addition, the scholarship will also cover healthcare and uh, um, monthly stipend. But in, uh, it's because of the um, limited number of, um, um, of the scholarships, so the selection will be um, will be competitive, yeah. Josh, you're muted. Did you say something? Sorry. Um, yes, is there anything you want to add? I want to make sure that we're, we're given uh, accurate information. I, I don't have anything to add for this. Uh, All right. Yeah. Um, there are some questions about GRE. We're going to get to that in a moment. Um, general requirements for the for the PhD program, master's or bachelor's degree, minimum GPA of 3.0 for the undergrad and 3.5 for, for graduate if, if you're coming with a, with a master's degree, minimum 3.2 undergraduate GPA um, to apply if you're coming straight from a bachelor's program. Um, so prerequisite courses, uh, Nathan, Nathan, I think you were asking some questions about this. Um, we want a strong foundation in mathematics, obviously, for, for, for this program. So um, courses covering multivariable calculus, matrix al algebra, statistics, um, and then experience with programming, um, familiarity with Java, Python, um, with some, some programming language, it's gonna be a key part to your success in the program. Um, for international students, if English is not your native language and you have not graduated from an accredited US institution, the TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo, any one of those three assessments will be required. There are some exceptions um, in unique circumstances, but again, part of what we're looking for is to make sure that when students come in the program, the foundational knowledge, those obstacles are out of the way, um, this is going to, as a PhD program, the reading and writing will be intensive. Um, we want to make sure that you're in a position to be successful with the program. The GRE is required um, unless, again, you've graduated from a U.S. institution, um, an accredited U.S. institution. Um, you have to request the waiver for that, um, but that's the, that is the current requirement. And then a little bit more information um, for international applicants. Um, some of the base score. All this information is on the website. Um, and and as I said at the very beginning, this is the this is the start for many of you of a of a longer conversation. And we're here to try to answer questions as you start to go through this process. For many of you, you may be thinking about 2025 um, as a start date. For some of you, we talk about graduate school. Usually, there's an 18 month runway for people to figure out. Yes, I want to do this figure out the schools, the options, the programs, the funding, all those sorts of things need to get aligned. So we anticipate this to be a longer conversation and we will be here as a resource for you as you go through that. Dr. Lee, anything you wanna add? Yeah, so there are questions in the uh, chat box asking whether uh, English proficiency can be waived. So if you're from a 
English speaking country, then yes, there we do have the waiver that you don't need to uh, take the TOEFL uh, test. But in general, if uh, for international students, we do have the English proficiency um, requirement. And for GIE, it, uh, there is an option to waive your GIE. And we have that uh, conditions listed here. At least one of these criteria need to be met. Yeah. <clears throat> Nathan, uh, okay. And there are also questions about uh, part-time students, like how long do we expect a part-time student to graduate from the program? So for part-time students, that's really uh, case by case. Uh, Usually, in general, we expect part-time students take longer than uh, full-time students because they, they handle like full-time work and study that's harder. But it still depends on individual students and academic academics uh, advisor. So we do have a, uh, min a maximum time that a student need to graduate from the school. But case by case, I think in general, part-time students you will take uh, one or two years longer than full-time students. Um, yep. This might also be helpful to um, to the question about advanced standing. Probably ought to move this up. Or yeah. <clears throat> we, have, we have questions about advanced standing. Um, option from, from the chat box as well. So in general, if you have a master's degree in computer science, statistics, and data science, you probably will uh, meet this criteria. So we do have the criteria uh, list here about advanced standing option. So you, you do need to demonstrate you have a stronger background in statistics. For example, you have one or more courses in advanced uh, statistics, and then uh, your strong background in machine learning. Uh, visualization and communication with data, as well as uh, databases. So um, as um, Dr. John mentioned in the chat box, if you have a computer science degree in a master's degree, a statistic master's degree, most likely you'll be uh, qualified, but the recruitment committee will uh, look at your, your uh, application and decide whether you're qualified for advanced standing option or not. So a couple other questions in the chat about um, full-time versus part-time and whether or not evening courses will be available. Yes, there will be evening courses that will be available. There may be occasions, though, where you have to be on campus during the day for, for seminars. So I, that, that's not a 100%. Um, and then I'm trying to think, trying to see what other questions we may have missed in the, in the chats. Um, There is no, <clears throat> yeah, the GRE we've answered um, <clears throat> in terms of um, full-time. Courtney uh, has a question about full-time versus part-time. <clears throat> That's determined semester by semester. There may be, um, if you are a full-time student, um, it's partially your enrollment for that semester. It's going to determine whether or not you're a full-time student. To be eligible for funding, you need to be enrolled in nine credit hours or in dissertation research. Um, yeah, I see one question from Anusa regarding uh, if you, if I apply, yeah, if I can apply first, even I don't have a particular faculty as a, an advisor. So the answer is yes. Even though we strongly re recommend that you, you do have some faculty member in mind that you want to do your PhD research with him or her. But of course, you can apply first because the first year students are expected to uh, take the core courses. So within that time, you still can uh, reach out and talk to our faculty and then see who you want to be work with in the future. We got a lot of questions rolling in the chat. Um, so <laughs> uh, there's a question about taking the program from a, from a different country. I'm assuming that means, can you take the program remotely? Can you do it online? The answer is no, it's a face-to-face -face program. Um, if you're an international student um, applying for the program, you would you'd have to go through the F1 process, um, even if you've done it before, uh, if you're a DSBA alum, for example. Um, and then the other question that's showing up a lot is, how do you apply for the GRE waiver? 
The GRE waiver is just a simple email to myself or Carly Mahidi. Um, we'll have our contact information on the last slide. Um, once you have submitted your application, so all the you've made your request for recommendations, you've submitted the, the application form, the, the, the application fee, all that, just um, send an email saying, I believe I qualify for the GRE waiver. We'll review it, we'll, um, we'll approve it, and then we'll issue it. It's a manual process, unfortunately, but um, we're pretty good about getting that turned around in 24 hours or less once the request comes. But you can't send the request until you've submitted the application itself. Yes, yes. Don't forget to uh, attach the uh, evidence to demonstrate you actually meet the criteria to waive the GRE so we can review. Actually, I can I can make that easier because once you've submitted your application, all of your transcripts will be part of that. Um, and so that's really what we need. And so just a simple email and we'll take care of it. Make sure it gets put through. OK. Um, there's a question about. Um, Josh, is this a last slide? Uh, no. Uh, so oh, OK. <laughs> One <point. laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we can, you know, if we finish the slides, we can go through all the questions in the in the chat, you know, one by one, you know, some of them are similar. So we, we can go from there. Um, there's a question again about the online pathways. And at this point, there is not an online option for, for the PhD program. It is a face-to-face -face program. We, that, that mentoring is a, a real value add. Um, we understand that makes it, challenging for folks who may be out of the area. Um, and um, question also about GPA minimums. Um, they are not absolute. Uh, if, for example, one of the one of the situations we have is somebody may have a long professional career is coming back for, um, for the PhD, that GPA may be old. Um, there may be some other mitigating factors we looked at. Now, one of the options is also um, you can look at doing additional coursework to demonstrate the ability. Uh, that's another way, excuse me, that's another way. Mm -hmm. So I saw several questions about uh, about like uh, how do we how how do we know how which faculty are recruiting PhD students? So in general, for graduate faculty uh, at UNC Charlotte, they're, they're actively uh, recruiting PhD students. But if you're particularly looking for a faculty member with active funding support and things like that, you probably need to look into uh, those faculty members uh, whose uh, research is of your interest and see usually I won't say all, but most of the faculty members will have their personal page where you can find their research details as well as uh, their funding support. So that's one way for you to go about. So, so I have a suggestion here. Um, uh, I would not suggest students to choose a faculty as their mentor sim uh, just because this faculty provides funding, right? So you really need to think about what's your um, research interest, right? What kind of research you want to focus on in your dissertation, uh, uh, you know, as your dissertation research. And then look for faculty from the school uh, faculty list to see which faculty has expertise in that area. And then reach out to the faculty about potential, you know, whether the faculty can provide some uh, research funding, so, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, Nathan, you asked about uh, the 18 credit hour uh, core courses. So it is planned that students will take the 18 credit hours of core courses in the first year, like 16 of them in the first year, and then two other seminars in the second year. So when students finish the first year, of course, they will be ready for the qualifying exam. So that one year, two semesters. Mm -hmm. um, Vincent asked a question, when is a, a decision likely to be made on application? So um, we plan to review the deadline of application is February 1st. So uh, we plan to finish the, the review by the end of February. 
So hopefully we can send out notifications in early March. If not earlier, yeah. Question about TA positions. The, the TA positions are part of the funding package. They are available to admitted students, well-qualified admitted students who are full-time um, to, to reiterate that point. Um, um, so what I'm going to ask the uh, so, 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 sorry, Josh. One thing I do want to remind all the st uh, students who are interested in submitting an applica uh, application, please do make it clear in your personal statement if you want to be a, a part-time or full-time student. Sorry, Josh. No, 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 no. <laughs> We've got a lot. I mean, the, the great news is we've got some fantastic questions. They're just kind of coming, um, uh, doing that. Um, Jadide, I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. My apology. You've raised your hand. You have a question you want to ask? You want to come off mute and ask? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, I'm speaking from Brazil now. And... Mm -hmm. I just want to point that I hold a bachelor degree in computer in computer engineering and master in computer science, and now I'm pursuing my my uh, master in data science and analytics here in Brazil. And, uh, as Professor mentioned, I see that you mentioned that those who have master degree from a USA institution, they may they may get a chance to to have a GRE waiver, but I did not see something about international students, those who have master degree from an institution that is not from the USA. Do I have any chance? Or I mean, those who have a master degree from an institution that is not uh, institution, some institution that is not from the USA can get this GRE wa waiver or only for this waiver is just for those who have master degree from USA institution. Because wh why I'm asking this? Because now I'm I'm focusing in my paper and then English. Test and then uh, I can't I can't afford GRE test. To be honest, Dr. Lee, do you wanna? Yeah, thank you for the question. So in general, at this moment, we still have that two criteria that so you do have to get a, a degree from a. U U.S. university or you hold a terminal degree. So that's more about like a, yeah, English efficiency other than uh, like a academic. Yes. I mean, the we, we just want to make sure that especially for international students, uh, when they come in, they have uh, sufficient levels of uh, English proficiency uh, that can um, can succeed in the program. I mean, we are not, you know, um, trying to um, to give a hard requirement, but you know, we want to make sure, uh, from a language perspective, our international students uh, would not have problem uh, in the classroom and also in communication with professors, so on and so forth. If that answers. Yes, yeah, uh, but I, I, I understand about English test uh, proficient. I understand about that. Uh, I was just wondering about GRE waiver because I did not see this information about international students. So that's that's what I mean. You know, if you are an international student, um, you never studied um, in U.S. and uh, you know basically there's no evidence to um, to help us understand the level of English proficiency you have. Uh, then um, the GRE is generally expected. 
Thank you. Yeah, sure. Got a question in the chat box about um, asking about more details about the qualifying exam. So I would like to uh, explain that a little bit more. So first of all, the qualifying exam will be an oral exam. That means you are going to do a presentation about a, a research proposal. So because uh, as I mentioned, the first year students will going to take all the core courses, which will help you be like a, um, obtain the skill sets like uh, you, you know the fundamentals of statistics, uh, machine learning, AI, AI, and then ethics. And then you also have the research design course in the first year. So basically, uh, we expect after the first year of courses, you will be able to uh, write up a research proposal by following the research design like you have learned and uh, present that to the committee. So uh, that's generally the form. Like it will be an oral presentation kind of exam. And then uh, you need to write up a proposal based on by using the skill sets you learn from the first year, and then demonstrate that you you are able you're capable of uh, uh, having your research problem um, written up and, and fit in a really nice framework. That's basically the um, qualifying exam format. So there's a question about. Um... You know, can students take classes uh, online? Um, this program will be, um, you know, on campus program. We don't plan to offer um, online courses. Yeah. <clears throat> also, there's another question asking about whether we're, uh, we'll recruit students in the spring. So at this moment, we don't have plan to recruit in the spring. So the uh, earliest recruitment time will be for 2025. Um, Ricardo, you've had your hand up. Do you wanna jump in? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect, thank you, thank you. It's, it's so promising to see and to have this program and uh, UNC Charlotte, this, this is very promising. I, I'm so excited for this. Uh, I think that you made emphasis on the collaboration that you will have or that the program has with multiple departments in the uh, UNC Charlotte. How are you guys planning on bringing in expertise from the um, industry? Uh, I, I know that some members from the industry, I know well, very well, um, Agos is going to be part of maybe your associated faculty. He's an ex Wells Fargo brand. What are the ideas that you have in mind about how to bring <laughs> in the problems that the industry are facing is facing right now in Navy to incorporate that as part of the program. Mm. I, I'm gonna share my thoughts, right? So first of all, I think you know having industry partnership is very valuable. Uh, you know, it can be, you know, from a from your dissertation research perspective, um, this partnership can be integrated into your research in different aspects. Just give you one example I can think of. You know, we may invite, uh, you know, you may invite an industry, um, you know, person to join your committee, dissertation committee, if this person has a PhD degree, right, as a potential um, committee member, right? I mean, you can work on a problem uh, that is very related to what the industry is, is experiencing um, as long as it has scientific merit of Thank your you. work. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah I, one thing to add is because uh, UNC Charlotte is located in, in Charlotte, this is a fast growing city. And then a lot of our faculties are, are working with the industry partner as well, like for their research. So. Thank you, thank you. He has a question about the uh, academic track um, and whether or not there's a requirement if you're considering the academic track to have teaching experience. The answer is no. Remember, academic track is also research and there will be, you'll get teaching opportunities to the TA position um, if you're accepted to the program. Um, so it's the, the background of teaching is not so required. Um, and then um, Hadiza has the question, I'm doing information technology and management majoring in data analytics from the US. Can I get the GRE waived? 
Yes, if it's a U.S. accredited U.S. institution, again, the GRE can be waived. Um, it's through that, that simple email process um, once you've completed, as long as you have the appropriate GPA as well. Kind of go back to it, see what questions we've missed. If we've missed your question, Amen, you you got your hand up. Um, why don't we just have folks uh, put your hand up and we'll try to call on you one at a time then. Amen. Oh, oh, thank you for the the opportunity to uh, ask my question. Um, I mean, when I when I read the when I read the the post about the program, I saw somewhere it said that um, we can. I mean, there is a two focus for the program. There will be a focus on the academy, those that plan to uh, to to get into the academia, and the, those that plan to work in the industry. So I wanted to ask because sometimes. You can sort the program having a plan. I mean, a long term plan, and then along the down down downline the line the line, you can change your person. I mean, your goal. Like somebody who started like okay at the beginning of the program, the plan to become to work in the academia, and then when they started the program, they found that okay now I will work in the academia as a part time like part time professor, not like a full time teacher, and then they would. There might be, there might be, they might decide. Uh, I mean, they might decide to also work in the industry. So, is there any way to, I mean, is there any way to handle that? Like somebody who start like uh, with a plan, with a goal to work in the academia, and then okay, at the end, I want to work in the academia, but at the same time, working in the industry. Well, and I'll start this. I'm, I'm sure Dr. James going to want to throw in his two cents on this one as well. But I'll start this by saying in the announcement. One of the part of the DNA of our program, and again, there's several alums of, of our master's programs and, and a few from our undergraduate program as well, um, <clears throat> is that we've got a strong focus on applied research, and that means industry engagement. So we work closely with industry partners across the Charlotte area. For those of you who are familiar with Charlotte, um, we are a banking center, but we also have a significant retail um, presence, uh, manufacturing, supply chain. We have industries that represent all of those areas. And they are closely connected to the university. So on the one hand, we want to make sure that we're doing cutting edge research that allows innovation, um, that allows innovation and us to support the community. Um, but in that support, we're, we're looking for industry, for industry partnerships. We're looking for ways to connect our students. In terms of your path, you may start an academic path and move to an industry path or vice versa. Um, Dr. Lee or Dr. Jang, do you want to? So, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, um, regardless whether in the future you will pursue an academic um, position or industry position, uh, we offer the same training, right? So the, the program is trying to uh, prepare you to be a you know, data science um, researcher, uh, regardless of whether you are you will be in academic institution or industry, right? So you, you should have the same, um, same type of training here. We don't have different tracks, one for industry, one for uh, academics. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, reemphasize the program is uh, designed to uh, help our students to be successful in either industry or academic. So it's a personal experience, based on my personal experience, more of the students' uh, interest at the end, like which path you want to go. Yeah. Richard? Yes, thank you. Um, if I got like a, the uh, the patterns approved by US Bureau regarding like a statistic modeling and uh, the AI machine learning, would that be considered as my like a, the uh, credential uh, to for the advanced courses, or it's only based on like the uh, graduate school or mm -hmm. my prior college? I mean, uh, academic performance. So if, if you're asking from a credit transfer perspective, uh, that might be difficult because we can only transfer something, you know, transfer 
whatever course credits you had before that are relevant to the program. If that's a patent which is really valuable but not a course credit, uh, it's very difficult to, to um, consider it as an equivalent of credits you have taken. Not sure if I ans uh, answered your question. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, I, I believe it is. I mean, uh, cannot be uh, convert. <laughs> right, you. right. I mean, uh, that definitely shows your knowledge on AI machine learning. You know, don't get me wrong. But, you know, when we cons when the university consider a, a credit transfer, we have to make sure, you know, you have taken a certain relevant course that is transferable. Yes, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Bobby. And thanks, thanks, Josh. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Zhang, and Josh, you know, thanks for giving this information. Uh, my question is like, uh, as I understood, the like six research areas uh, that we would be, you know, uh, kind of doing an expertise on eventually. So, part of the application, do I have to mention which area is it, okay. or you know, I can <clears throat> figure it out later? That's a very good question. First of all. By no means, we are suggesting that your dissertation research has to be selected from one of those six, right? So um, you can select any research areas where, you know, we have some faculty working in that area. That would be totally fine, right? Um, when you submit an application, the personal statement, uh, which probably you have also uh, prepared a similar one when you applied for for your undergrad for your bachelor you know for your master de uh, you know degree um, you need to prepare a personal statement to explain uh, why you are interested in pursuing a PhD degree what's your career goal and particularly what might be the research areas you are interested in so that we can make sure we have faculty with expertise in that area that could be potentially could be your mentor. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, Lakshmi? Yeah, thanks Joshua and thanks everyone for giving this opportunity. So I am currently pursuing a master degree with our UNCC PSBA. So I'll be completing mostly by spring. So am I eligible to apply for it? Can I transfer credits from my master degree? So I just wanted to know more detailed version of it. So thank you. So if you're if apply for the advanced standing option, then you're not uh, allowed to transfer credits because uh, we do have very much, very few credit hours requ required for the advanced standing students. But if you apply for uh, standard uh, standing uh, curriculum, then you, you can transfer up to nine credit hours of your credit. Okay, okay. So this opens up in uh, fall 2025, right? So, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Martin? Uh, please, thank you for the opportunity you're giving me. Uh, my name is Martin from Ghana. Uh, I am currently pursuing my Master of Philosophy in Applied Statistics, Data Science Option, which I will be completing in the first quarter of 2025, which is next year. So I wanted to know if I am eligible to apply. Then the second question has to do with the GRE. Let's assume that someone from a, a foreign country with a strong CGPA for both undergraduates, because my undergraduate, I did mathematics. Uh, like with a strong CGPA, let's say 3.7, <laughs> Uh, the two of them, can you apply for the GRE waiver? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the for the uh, for the good question. Um, first of all, you know the um, the very good GPAs in um, in a related field uh, would demonstrate that you have 
uh, preliminary knowledge related to data science, uh, but it does not have any um, indication in terms of English proficiency, right? So those I consider those are two um, two separate um, two separate things. Uh, please, uh, it's like if you take my country Ghana like this. Uh, even starting from our basic school, all our education is being had in, 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 in English. So I don't know if there is a, an opportunity for something like that. Thank you very much. Is English your uh, official language? Yes, please. OK. Yeah, we never, we never thought about that. But we, we can consider, we, we can discuss. Okay, yeah. thank you very uh, Martin, much. Martin, uh, follow up with a, with an email and then um Okay. Your request. We'll we'll discuss. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. We're coming on time and Bushra, I'm gonna give you the chance to have the, the, the last question. But as I said at the very beginning, this is the beginning of a conversation with you all. And we would encourage you to reach out um with a, with follow-up questions um and to, to potentially set up time one on one if you have more detailed information you need. We're here to, to do our best to try to answer your questions. Um, Bushra, you want to throw out the last question for us today? Uh, so thank you so much for this informative session. And I would like to know that teaching assistantship is for every admitted student or there will be a selection criteria for that? It's not for every student, you know. Um... So students come in, you know, uh, may potentially get uh, two types of uh, a, a scholarships. One as, assistantship. So one is a teaching assistantship, uh, which uh, you know the student is expected to be a TA or teacher course. Um, the other one is a research assistantship, where um, the student will be funded by his or her mentor uh, using the faculty's own research grant. Thank you, sir. Sure. All right. Um, thank you again. We're going to direct you to uh, the website. We will share the recording of this in the slide deck um, with the group later today. Um, we want to thank you all for making time and for your interest in UNC Charlotte and the School of Data Science and our new PhD program. We're, we're looking forward to, uh, to working with you in the future. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Yeah, please feel free to uh, email us if you have any uh, further questions. Thank you very much again for attending. Thank you all. Thank you.